Uh, yeah, you a golf man? You play golf? I play a little bit of golf. Yeah, I've Not been so pl- much anymore, but uh, just get on the links, have a couple beers, have a good time. I was just gonna say, I've been known to hit eighteen and drink six. <laughs> drink six? I've been known to hit eighteen and drink thirty-six. Anyway, my name is Dom DiTola. I am one of your hosts here at the Sports Experience Podcast alongside my co-host today, Chris Quinn, and we're getting a little golf action in. Yeah, I like this. We're getting uh, the whole 18 in today. How the about whole that? 18, yes. Yeah. And uh, today's episode is uh, VJ Singh. Yeah, somebody that uh, I wouldn't say I followed during his career, but uh, I definitely was aware of because he was through this Tiger era of just, like, ridiculous dominance, but we see he's like this other guy. He's like this other guy. Everyone always tries to, like, pit Tiger and Mickelson against each other. Yeah. But this gentleman uh, was ranked number one during the midst of the era of dominant whore bang in Tiger Woods. Well, we've talked about this and possibly bringing a whole podcast on it, on how some athletes just, uh, they get into this zone of womanizing and like it's their top game. And But this is this era for Tiger in which he was just dominating. But we see VJ was just absolutely had so, one of the best records of consistency. Yeah, he was a very consistent golfer and he came at a time when nobody thought Tiger Woods was touchable as far as, you know, eclipsing what he was setting in the specific sport. As far as dethroning him as number 1 too, which is I mean in golf you see number 1 get switched up a bunch, but back then it was just all Tiger. It was all Tiger. But let's get started. When was Alrighty. he uh, I like I like it to hear when he was uh, born from you. Uh February 22nd, 19 19- 63 in Lautoka, Fiji. Yep. And the Fiji thing is so interesting to me because he obviously didn't grow up with any golf courses. No. Uh-uh. He, and his dad said, I hate to say it, but golf balls don't fall off trees. Yeah, that was a funny story. His dad said, uh, golf balls don't fall off trees because they were very expensive and they yep. were kind of poor growing up there uh, out in the uh, South Pacific. But uh, he said, so I found some that did. Yeah. But they weren't golf balls. They were coconuts. <laughs> Which is crazy to think. I'm thinking like how big of the, co- like, would he go for smaller ones or like, would he try and get like unripened ones? Like, I don't know, but I imagine he just pretty much went for a ball and was hitting it. Yeah. He, um, he would talk about how his dad had worked over at the airport there. Yep. And he would go through like these water drainage systems just to get to the airport so he could go and hit golf balls. Yeah. Golf balls all day, just work on his game. Yeah. No, it's it was complete dedication to a game that was almost non-existent in this country. That's what's so interesting to me is like in Fiji, I wonder how many golfers there were. There probably aren't many. A handful? Yeah. Maybe. I that's, mean, that's what I mean, especially in this era in in the, in the 60s, 70s, when he's growing up. He, it, it's so, for him, it, he's pretty much just found this game, and he's like, I love this game, and I'm going to play it to my heart's content because, I mean, we see he kind of struggles to find himself on the pro circuit. Yeah, he does definitely does that. And even as a kid, he played a whole bunch of different sports like cricket and soccer and yes. rugby because at the time, uh, Fiji's part of the British Empire. Um, he's actually not a native uh, Fijian, though, like a native islander of Fiji. Uh, both of his parents are uh, Indian. Yeah. Which uh, historically, if you don't know, um, in a lot of the old British colonies, um, they would import labor from India and send it all over the world. Like one of the most famous examples is Mahatma Gandhi. He was born and raised in South Africa. Yes. Not from not born and raised in India, even though he's Indian. Uh, the northern part of South America with Guyana, a lot of people live there are Indian from South Asian Indian. Yes. And Fiji, it's pretty much 50-50 as far as Indians and native Fijians. So, and that'll come back into play later with, as he starts gaining fame. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because there's various bits of racism that come with this where they're not necessarily able to identify as Indian. They're not necessarily able to identify as Fijian, but we'll, we'll get into that. So I want to start with him on the Asian tour because he talks about not being able to practice on 
pro style golf courses like he wants. So yeah. he's pretty much going, this is what I saw in an interview with him. He's pretty much going to public golf courses because that's all he can afford. That's all he can really get on. Mm -hmm. And he said the difference between pro and public golf courses are so much that when he would get out there, he would pretty much be like, oh shit, this is how we putt. Yeah. Like, right. Because I mean, that's the big thing everybody says is the, that's kind of the drawback to his entire game are the differences between the greens yep. of the two types of courses. And if you look at him as a professional golfer, if there's one drawback to his game, it is putting. Yes. Because everyone would say, if he's putting well, everybody's in trouble. And I feel like it's because he didn't grow up putting like all these other fucking guys yeah. did. Like, there's no like putting green surrounding the airport in uh, Fiji. Exactly. You know? like, exactly. When Tiger was growing up, he was doing like six hours of putting every day. You yeah. know, like it's such, it was such, that's why I love how great he becomes because he has such a different path than everybody else. It's, everybody else. It's the most interesting path. I mean, and it's not like it's someone, Oh, who can't afford to go to a country club. This guy is barely finding courses to golf on. Yes. Which is absolutely remarkable. But, uh, in 22, uh, or at age 20, uh, 1982, he ends up turning professional. And like you said, he joins the, uh, Asian golf tour circuit. Uh, and this is where, right off the bat, we see a bit of controversy with him. So he's really good um, because he wins the Malaysian uh, PGA Championship, but... 1984, yeah. And that's in 1984, so he's he's playing for like two years or so. Mm -hmm. But right after that, I believe, it comes with some controversy where he doctors his scorecard. 1985, yeah. And that's in 85. Because he went, he had marked himself for a minus one when he actually had a plus one. Okay. Which is a two-stroke uh, difference. Yeah. Yes. Just so he can make the cut. Mm -hmm. Just so he can keep playing golf. Yes. <laughs> um, and I found this really interesting because his stance was he should have just been kicked out of the tourney and possibly had a, a small suspension, which was normal for this kind of rule breaking. Exactly. Yeah. That's not what happened. That is definitely not what happened. Um, the commissioner of the Asian PGA came out and gave him a lifetime ban, which was wild. It's pretty insane to think about for just something like that. Granted, you know, he did screw up. And it was later proven that he knowingly did screw up. That's why. That's what I heard was their contention was he knew he knowingly cheated and then tried to kind of cover it up, and they didn't like any of that and didn't want to be associated with that. Mm -hmm. um, some of it might have to do with bits of racism in this. I'm sure there is a little bit <laughs> because there was something that was said that the. Uh, a fisher, uh, official was from Indonesia, which didn't, you know what? We're not going to get into the political bullshit of, of Asia right now, Yeah, but there was just some kind of stuff behind the scenes where he obviously came out and didn't understand the lifetime ban for this. It should have just been a expelling from the tourney and a, and a small suspension. Yeah. And he, he's almost at rock bottom. Like his professional career is almost over before it really necessarily starts. And he ends up working at a, a golf course in uh, Sabah, Malaysia. Which I believe for the mindset that he's probably going through, he's probably just going to be like, well, I'm going to be a golf pro here for the rest of my life. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I, I, like, well, I guess this is what the cards have dealt me. Exactly. You know, because dealt. the Asian tour, um, it's like a hierarchy, a hierarchy. The Asian tour, I believe is like towards the, lower end especially in this era it's going to be asian european and then and then what, pga yeah but it, what he has ends up having to do is he ends up playing on and i love this name too the this safari is, circuit oh my god i had to look more into it to see what it was because it it ends in the 90s but it's a yeah. it's an african golf circuit that is a direct feeder into the european pga which i found so Interesting because it was a line for these African Asian golfers to get into the European line as opposed to the Asian. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of like the last, you know, stop. Yes. On the end, or it's either the first stop or the last stop. Exactly. So at. I was going to say for some Africans, it's the first. For some other country men, it's definitely like the last chance effort. And he goes in and, and really does great. And that's where you see his game really 
start to form. Yeah, he wins the 1988 uh, Nigerian Open there on the safari circuit, and then he's starting to kind of be noticed by uh, the European tour with how good he is. I mean, he obviously can't go back to Asia, but, you know, he's finally proving himself as a really good golfer, and he's finally getting the opportunity to just reinvent himself. Real quick, a little additive. He was able to go on this safari tour because Red Baron yeah, was his sponsor. Which is outstanding. Which, you know what? They had an awful pizza, but it was <laughs> always in my refrigerator. Um, he actually wins back-to-back um, Nigerian he Opens. He does, yeah. Which I thought was pretty interesting. And then his second, his second time trying to qualify for the European uh, PGA, he actually qualifies. And... And uh, he won the uh, Zimbabwe Open. That's not even the name of the country anymore. Exactly. No, it is the new name of the country, but yeah, exactly. Like playing all over that continent. If you're, yeah, if you're wondering why the uh, safari circuit isn't going on anymore, there's so many coups that happened (laughs) between here and now. It's different countries exist. But something that I want to say that he takes from this era of, traveling Africa, traveling Europe, because he kind of does both at the same time, is people say he plays more tourneys than anybody else on the circuit. And you and you can see this even in his old age. Yep. This guy just wants to golf. He just wants to train, and he wants to golf and be the best he possibly can be. Yeah, and I feel like he's had that since he was a kid. Yeah, I mean, what else are you going to do all day? Yeah. I'm going to go to the airport and hit some golf balls. What? What? <laughs> But uh, he, he uh, on the European tour, he wins the uh, 1989 Volvo Open Championship. In Italy. In Italy. And then uh, just continues kicking ass going on that particular tour. Well, I feel like this is where golfers kind of make their line to the PGA. So it's never yeah. like that quick jump. You always have like two or three years in Europe, and you kind of get your feet underneath you. And then he jumps to the PGA in 1993. Uh-huh. He finally gets his card. And immediately starts winning. Yeah, so, he, come, it's, he comes out of nowhere. He's yeah. just like a shock, a good shock to the golf world. Well, I mean, he's 30 at this point, is he not? Yeah, most guys which, are in their early to mid-20s. Exactly, which I feel like is for golf prime. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I have to say like this, but I, I want to say he kind of has a later start. So I wouldn't say this is his prime, but he's good enough to come in right away and win and be the 1993 Rookie of the Year. Yeah. Because mm-hmm, he wins the uh, Buick Classic. Yeah, he wins that a few times. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's like like a lot of people say. Like some golf courses just are made for some golfers. That one, yeah, definitely for him. Yeah, but uh, yeah, 1994 wins the Buick Open or Classic, and then uh, 1995 he won the Buick Classic and the Phoenix Open. Yeah, he won the Phoenix Open a couple of times too. Yeah, so- I think that was back before they had that stadium built around the par three. Oh, it, yeah. I think it's right in that era Okay, of that, you know what I mean, the ASU crowd cheering kind of, the complete opposite of what golf should be, but right. for some reason it works in Phoenix, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, yeah, but he's just, he's being a, a consistently good golfer, so he's winning about one tourney a year, and then he wins his first major in 1998. Or, excuse me, he wins the... In 97, he wins a couple of, of tourneys, and then in 98, he wins his first major. Yeah, the 1998 one, that was an amazing weekend for him. Uh, ends on uh, August 16th, 1998. Um, he finally broke through and won the PGA Championship at uh, Sam Amish Washington Golf Course. Yeah. Yep. And uh, Day two, you got to talk t- about oh, day two. Day two is when he really kind of turns everything on, is he ties a course record for a 66 which means he shot 600 par which is insane at a major yeah with golf's best you know stars and he's the brightest star of that weekend it's his like you know everything from 1985 on has been leading to this moment where he finally breaks through Hey, everybody. Just want to take a quick break to uh, let you know that our Sports Experience podcast is brought to you by Engel Studio here, and uh, they're here in Tucson for all your recording needs. Well, this is where, so from like 85 on, I bet everybody was looking at him as a good golfer, like he could win a tourney. Yeah. This was the, the PGA Championship was the time where everyone was like, oh, shit, this guy is like 
serious with that 66 with the you know just the way he won it and yeah yeah he won by two strokes over a gentleman named steve stricker yep yeah and uh he parlays that into another victory a couple weeks later uh on uh, august 23rd actually the next week uh 1998 he won the sprint international yeah so he's finally in that mix of the golfers to watch the best golfers on the tour exactly and this is i want to point out this is right when we get the injection of money yep so like if you look at the earnings it skyrockets so much from about 98 onward it's it's insane yeah no it totally is and that has to do with him tiger i feel like a lot more of this non- monochromatic yes thing, exactly if you know what little, i mean a little more uh, diversity in golf exactly You've gone from the safari circuit and the uh, nigerian and zimbabwe opens to winning the pga championship that must have been so awesome and it's not a huge time from you know what i mean no. it's a decade so yeah. like i'm just saying like that's really really i mean yeah i got to give it up to him because i mean we were talking about it in 87 88 He's really thinking about not playing golf professionally or or it's probably being batted around his head. Yeah, he, he's probably having at least doubt. Oh, he has to. I <laughs> mean... They threw me off the Asian tour. Where am I going to go? Exactly. Which, yeah. And then a decade later, PGA champion with a, with a tie on a course record, which I'll, I'll never... I mean, it's so crazy for me. I don't know how good a golfer you are, but uh, when I shoot 100, I'm like... Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, get that one birdie in. You're like, I don't know how it happened, but I'll take it. Plus seven on the next hole at the very least. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's when I stopped counting, but I still attempt it. But so he he has some wins, but then let's talk about 2000. Yeah. You know what? He wins the Honda Classic in 99. And then on April 9th, 2000. Gold jacket. He becomes a legend. Green jacket. Who Who gives gives a a shit? shit? (laughs) You know what? That's one of the best lines, but we're definitely not talking about how the Masters isn't amazing because he goes on and, and wins a Masters, wins a gold, a green jacket, excuse me, I'm getting all mixed up in my own <laughs> mind, um, which has to be so awesome and is one of my favorite trophies because it's kind of a silly look, but then when you see them all up there, you're like, yeah. oh, I get it. Yep. I get it. A tradition unlike any other, exactly. as famed douche canoe Jim Nance always says. Oh, I wish they would switch those guys oh, out, but that's all right. Jesus. What's the one guy that's amazing? I can't think of his name. I don't know. Golf announcer. Oh, Vern Lundquist was always good. Yeah. Yeah. Happy Gilmore, too. He was in there. Yep. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, oh, so we beat uh, Ernie Els in this one by three strokes, but it was a it was a... A dominant victory for the Masters kind of is what people were saying was like, yeah, you can kind of see like, oh, shit, he's going to be really good. 2001, he actually doesn't have any wins. But one of the things I thought was so crazy was he had 14 top 10s. And it's almost like when we talked about in that Payne Stewart episode yep. is like, even if he's not winning He's in the mix on the final weekend of every tournament he's playing in. So with zero wins, he was fourth on the money list. That's what I find so crazy. Yeah, and we'll get into the money list uh, a few years later. But yeah, yes, he, yes. he is just raking in dollars. Because he's, and I want to say this is, guys will go through an entire year and play 14 events, if yeah. that makes sense. Like he'll play 28, 30 events or however many he can. That's why he has so many top 10s. And because he's so good. Yeah. So like, yeah, I, I, it's, that's why I love looking this shit up is I, I, VJ Singh for me, I remember watching a lot of these, you know, because you would watch with Tiger and all this in this era. And yeah, he, he was great. Yeah. And then in 2002, he's back on the, uh, you know, winning streak. He's winning the Shell Houston Open, which he did end up winning a couple. It seems he's winning all the same events. Like yes. when I was looking through them, it's like there were just certain courses that really spoke to him. Yeah, or he could really end up dominating on. I um, tried to look more into that, like what it was, but there really wasn't. I bet that's some real inside baseball golf talk where they were like, look, the greens are just not that rough. And then mm-hmm. he, you know what I mean? Like, but then in November of that year, he won the tour championship over Charles Howell III. So, I mean, like, 
at this point, you're not talking about like who the hell is VJ Singh? Where no. did this guy come from? You're just like VJ Singh's in this tournament, and if he's not going to win, he's going to be in the top ten. Exactly. No, this is he establishes himself so well in this early 2000s that I mean, we we're we're leading up to it. We're leading up to it. Um, 2003 is when this all starts. Do you want to well. talk a little bit with his controversy 2003 and then get into some good shit? Because I say controversy, but it's really not. That's why I want to address it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we can talk about his controversy. Um, so in 2003, um, a woman who actually went to the U of A, who's yep. one of the best uh, female golfers ever, Annika Sorenstam, uh, she was trying to be the first woman to play in a male PGA event since who? Babe Zaharias. Did, did we talk about her on the podcast? Hold up. Yeah. Did she fly across country and drink 100 beers? Was that who that was? I think it was. She rode a horse <laughs> around uh, Yankee Stadium. After, no, oh, Babe Diedrichsen oh, Zaharias, one of it. the best female athletes ever. She was as actually the first until Annika Sorenstam in 1945 when she played in the Los Angeles Open yep. against the dudes. And uh, when Sorenstam was uh, attempting to play, VJ made some... Uh, he had some choice words for her. So he had, he was talking shit on her coming in, but he was misquoted in something. I want to talk about the era yeah. after I get into this misquote. But what he said was he kind of didn't feel like she should have been in it because she was taking away spots from guys who essentially made the right path so they were kind of giving her a spot if that yeah they, they were going to give her a spot over golfers and i think a lot of this stems from how hard he had to work and the insane like wonky path he had to take yes. to become a professional golfer because i think he put himself in those other guys shoes yes who were fighting to get on the tour and fighting to get in these events and been like no because he, he said he wasn't against a woman competing in an open. He just wanted them to make it like all the other golfers. Yeah, to qualify. To qualify. Essentially. Which yeah. I, I actually agree with that. But then where he gets bogged down is they ask him if she would be paired with him. Yeah. How would they, how would that go? And his response was, we wouldn't be paired because I would be in a champions pairing um with another champion because yeah. that's like tv shit so they try exactly. and put two guys together so they can so and, i'll be golfing with tiger she'll be uh well, golfing that's, with somebody it's, else yeah it's it's not he's not being a dick he's just being like no like we literally wouldn't be paired and then what came out was and i swear to god it was something like this brown asian possibly muslim said he would <laughs> never golf with the woman by his side and he had to come out and defend it multiple times and be like i didn't say that that's a hundred say that i said she doesn't belong if she can't qualify yeah and that's and that's we see this era of i hate to say it sensationalizing but yes and that's this is the beginning it of is. it and the anti almost like not understanding who these people are because he's like Hindi. He didn't have this idea that women shouldn't do, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it's he, just complete misunderstanding, misquoting sensationalism, bad reporting, all, all of it. Just people looking for headlines and people with an ax to grind, trying to be a dick. Should, exactly. should he have said it? Probably not, but I can understand why he said it. And the fact, no, I'll be in the champions thing because that's exactly where he would have been. That's what I mean. I feel like he was just like giving facts and they were like, whoop, I got you on that. Like he wasn't, that was my big thing because I remember this and I remember because we brought up who we talk about outside of the podcast. We talk about like, who should we do this? And I remember thinking that VJ Singh came out talking shit on Annika Sorenstein. Sorenstam, yeah. Um, getting that opportunity, that was the narrative that I heard and I didn't research it enough like yeah. I did this time. So this is one of those things that I'm so glad I went back and researched on because it was like, it wasn't the opposite, but it definitely wasn't that. No, for sure. It was just him bluntly saying bluntly, how he felt. Yeah. And it wasn't like he was lying or being chauvinistic or no. anything. It was just him being like, yeah. Cool. That's the other thing I hate about 
a lot of these athletes aren't allowed or public figures aren't allowed to be as blunt as you could see they want to be because it just backfires for no fucking reason all right i'm getting angry let's get into 2003 which was his best year oh yeah outside of this little controversy one which uh, is in it's not even a controversy no i mean he won four tournament or yeah nine tournaments i believe or no it's four yes 18 top 10 finishes and he was the tour money leader. Yep. Not Shooter McGavin this not year. Not Shooter McGavin, not Tiger the Whorebanger, VJ Singh. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, a couple of outstanding things that he did on this. He shot a 29 on the back nine of uh, the U.S. Open, which is one of those ridiculous. That, that's insane. Yeah. That's just freaking absurd he didn't actually win the u.s open on that he had a, no. a really bad day but that's just to shoot a 29 on a on the um yeah whatever on a it's, nine hole on a nine it's insane but um, uh yeah wins the phoenix open again you know he earned more than one million dollars more than tiger did that year give me a, give me a number because i have the number here and i thought it was pretty fucking ridiculous he won seven million five hundred seventy three thousand nine hundred and seven dollars for hitting a golf ball it's so insane and that's not sponsorship money that is straight up no tourney winnings and he finished runner up to tiger that year for pga player of the year people thought he probably should have won that year but tiger had that you know he had that almost grand slam type deal going there in that era so it's like all right, fine. But 2004, you can't he, take it away from And him. I was going to say, he starts it off like he was doing. He does the, he wins the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am, even though uh, Bob Barker doesn't show up this he year. He does not. And that annoying guy played by Joe Flaherty yelling ex- expletives at him from the woods. Another great, so he has a lot of these great little uh, achievements. Another one is, he. Uh, this is his 12th consecutive top 10 finish which for a sport as hard as golf it's against insane. the best golfers to finish in the top 10 12 straight times how do you even do that i mean it's not the record no but but my god he was close i was gonna say i think it's, that's the closest we will ever see yeah because golf changing whatever whatever you want to talk about that 12 consecutive top 10s is probably the closest we'll ever see i think the record is 14 yeah mm-hmm. okay just checking. Just checking. But, uh, yeah. But then won his third major. It won his third major, yeah. Um, eight, uh, August 15th, 2004, he wins his PGA championship, his second PGA championship. Time. And this, this was really an interesting one because... Yeah, it was a three-way at the very end. Not yeah. a good three-way, whoa, but a three, uh, three-person three playoff. <laughs> it's a three-person playoff, and he was actually the... In his final round, he shot a 76 yeah. Which was the highest highest final round for a winner since 55. But and then... He probably could have closed it out. In, a, hu- a bunch of times. That's yeah. what people were saying was just like, he had an awful round and then the first playoff hole he birdied and yeah. everyone was like, oh shit, there you go. Yeah. Because he had a he had a great weekend leading into it and then sunday you just have a really bad i mean but he was so he had golfed so well prior exactly. to that that it kept him in the mix and he ended up beating uh, justin leonard and chris demarco yep so but yeah named pga golfer of the year this year made ten million nine hundred five thousand one hundred sixty six dollars so much money so like 2004 is like the pinnacle for this i was gonna say we got to talk about september 6 2004 yeah when the doja bank and he overtakes tiger as the number one after tiger had been number one in the world for 264 weeks oh totally it's crazy and that's what we were talking about with tiger was number one for all of this time and then we see vj come in and finally overtake him after i mean how many wins does he, he has to have a year with four wins he has 12 consecutive top tens yeah and this is when he finally overtakes tiger as number one and it's in this era where he's the only other number one that's not tiger yeah. i think it's 32 weeks he spent as the world's number one ranked golfer because he uh, surpassed Tiger, then Tiger took it back. Took from it him, back, but then t- uh, VJ took it back again. Yeah, which is like unbelievable. No, yeah, it's really the 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 story that this guy has going from we we brought it up again, going from getting bar- barred from Asia for life. 
<laughs> to being one of the greatest golfers in the early 2000s with Tiger. A lot of people get barred from Asia for life, but it's for a lot of other not golf things. I heard Dom can't go to Vietnam, but that's for a different <laughs> reason. Non-golf. It turns out it's cricket related. I'm not going to get into it today. Cricket injury related. Yeah. No, but uh, you got to understand crumpet before you understand cricket. cricket. <laughs> Casey Jones. All right. Uh, he wins the Sony Open in uh, 2005, um, but this is the year that he had lost but regained it from Tiger. He had three other wins later Well, this is in where the year. Tiger wins, that, uh, wins the Masters. Yeah. This is a famous Tiger kind of bullshit year, but then we see – that's why Tiger overtakes him. But then we see him get elected into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Which I thought was pretty cool. He was the youngest living person to be elected because he's – I mean, at this point, he's kind of old. He's older than everybody well, yeah. else. And this is where I want to get into right now is over 40, he eclipses the player with the most amount of wins. And I don't, I don't know if we'll see anybody in the PGA Tour over 40 with the most amount of wins. He has 22 right now. Yeah, it's, it, it's not even close. Yeah. And because most of the guys, when they're accumulating these wins, start in their early to mid-20s. Yep. He's winning championships at an age where you're not supposed to, where guys are like winding down their career and, and like maybe we'll have the one your tour. Yeah. yeah. Like maybe they'll have just one weekend bat out of hell style, but no, it doesn't happen. Or, Everybody I mean, thought VJ actually was going to go into the, what do they call it? The championship tour. Yeah. And I mean, he's there now, but I mean, but they thought you, they thought he was going to go in there like seriously, like 2008, 2009, but he kept playing, kept winning. And yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, winning these Barclays tournaments, like you know, two thousand six to two thousand eight. You know, you're the guy that I want. I want to emphasize this is just he loves golf. He yeah. loves training and he loves playing golf. He's not somebody that's gonna sit idly by while his career winds down. He's going to keep competing for better or worse, no matter where his skills are at. Well, I want to bring this up um, going going back because golf had a stigma that they attach to weight training yes and vj and tiger were the two guys that literally would go lift weights every day and showed what improvement it had on their golf game yeah and they're not trying to necessarily get jacked or no, anything no. is they were weight training to improve their bodies and help condition and make themselves better and you see every single golfer now does that yeah exactly and while he had you know some knee and back issues kind of in the late 2000s who knows how worse it could have gotten if he wasn't weight training yeah and then uh, he did run into that deer antler spray thing. Did you see that? I saw that, which I felt bad for because here we come more with the more racism. I, I yeah. distinctly remember it. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, let's get into it. He bought this spray for his skin, right? Yeah, Ray Lewis had used it um, later in his career with the Ravens, and there was a lot of controversy surrounding it. Well, so, what's it supposed to do? That was my, like... I, I think didn't... it's something for your joints and, okay. like, you know, to help improve, like, muscle recovery and stuff. Okay. So it's illegal. It, you're not a, you're not allowed to use it. But, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the PGA came out and tried to suspend him, and then he said that he had no idea, and he actually sued the PGA. And, and they settled it. And yeah, they settled. He, he went after him. Like, yeah. he, he has shown that he will never back down. No, I like that. I definitely like that, because it seemed very silly... In the in the time, yeah, know? but he ends up uh, joining the senior tour. Yep, ends up joining the senior tour there in the uh, mid to late twenty tens and uh, or twenty teens, and uh, won the twenty seventeen uh, Bass Pro Shops uh, tournament with uh, Carlos Franco there in April of twenty seventeen, and yeah. then uh, twenty eighteen won the Toshiba Classic, and then uh, later that uh, year uh, he won the. Uh, Senior Players Championship in a playoff. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Which is like, man, this dude has 34 career wins, and you never would have thought he would have got there. No. Yeah, that's why I love these stories of these guys with a different path than everybody else. And I bet he has some great stories about playing golf literally on like every continent that you could. At, yeah. In that era, you know what I mean? He went through them all. Well, I mean, when you think of PGA Tour players... 
you know, with the possible exception of like a Payne Stewart who had to kind of start off in Asia, it's usually yep. guys that are just jump right into the PGA or guys that go from Europe to the PGA. Exactly. Maybe they do one or two years in Europe, but everybody sees like, oh, they're not going to be here next year kind of shit. Yeah, no. this, this guy's golfing uh, in Zimbabwe on a safari circuit. Exactly. Yeah, I loved it. Two Nigerian Open. Yeah, the two Nigerian double Open. Nigerian Open champion VJ Singh. But uh, uh, he's a great ambassador for golf because much like Tiger, he is not of the Caucasian persuasion. Exactly. So he, uh, you know, from Fiji, Indian by descent, um, in May 2005, he was their goodwill ambassador yep. to kind of try and heal the tensions between Indians and native Fijians there on the islands there. Yep, because like we were saying, there's definitely various uh racisms and yes. things like that that occur between these two nations um and he is definitely someone that should be bringing them together because i mean he's, he's such a public such, figure exactly and he rose from almost nothing golfing outside an airport with coconuts that his dad found yeah i still want to know exactly what that meant like with the coconuts were they well, full sizes just, no they're not full sizes <laughs> but when they're on the top of the tree and they're like that big yep. you can maybe golf ball size and then go and whack them but uh, he did run into a little bit of controversy last year, which is kind of funny tying it all back into the Soren Stamp thing. Yep. He tried to go into this um, Corn Ferry Open where uh, kind of amateurs and people looking to stick and stay on the tour were playing. And uh, he wants to play because he loves to golf. And a lot of his contemporaries, or I shouldn't say a lot, there were some of his contemporaries, like Phil Mickelson was defending him saying, like, it's Vijay Singh. If he wants to play golf, he can play golf. Yeah. But there were some other people, uh, most notably a Brady Schnell, um, who called him a turd and a true piece of trash. Well, he felt like he was taking a spot away from somebody else, an amateur that could have gotten it, which is exactly what VJ was talking shit on Annika for doing. So it's kind of like one of those things. But I agree with Phil on this one. If VJ wants to play some golf, we're going to let him play some golf. Yeah, I mean, he's going to draw how many people to that tournament? He's one of the biggest names in the entire sport. He's in the Hall of Fame. I yeah. Mean, come on. Yep. But uh, yeah, that's VJ Singh, everybody. Hey, everybody. This is just a stock message at the end of every episode. We hope you enjoyed whatever athlete and or team that that episode was about. Just want to say, give us a quick follow on all social media. We have a YouTube channel, the Sports Experience Podcast. And we're on Instagram, Totolo Dominic and myself, C. Quinn Comedy. So give us a follow all around. Um, we're always recording right here at Angle Studio. Thank you all very much. <laughs>